So I welcome you again to Psych 127, which is a creativity and problem solving skills. Today, we'll be focusing more on divergent thinking, which is also called ideation. My name is Dario Odukoya. Now, I want to begin again by way of reflection time. I love this phrase taken from Matthew chapter five, verse 44. It says, love your enemies. I'm sure this is one phrase nobody, many people don't want to hear at all. They get angry even when you say, how can I love my enemies? I hate that guy over my dead body. But the wisdom of God says, love your enemies. Do you know this key? It has a way of elongating your life. It's the key to longevity. There have been plethora of testimonies. Those who cannot love their enemies end up keeping malice. They end up ent entering, I mean, developing what you call bitterness, which now develop negative emotions in them that may eventually not give birth to so many psychosomatic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, insomnia, and so on and so forth, just because of hatred for somebody or keeping malice with somebody, which is now causing bitterness in them and evoking a lot of negative, negative emotions. And actually in the School of Emotional Intelligence, those people have been classified to have low emotional intelligence. I hope you are not in that category. Is there anybody that you have hold grass with that and made up your mind you will never forgive? The wisdom of God say, let go, let God. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And in the process, you are heaping coals of fire on them and you have peace of mind. And so you live long and you live well. You can beat the wisdom of God. So I encourage you, love your enemies. But if you are not genuinely born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, it may not be easy to achieve. So give your life to Christ and be filled with the Holy Ghost and pray for the help of the Holy Ghost to love your enemies. And so you enjoy by the grace of God longevity. I see you living long and living well in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. So let's now continue with our psychology, you know, creativity and problem solving skill. Today we are focusing on divergent thinking. And divergent thinking basically is ideation. From the word, the root word for ideation is generating idea. So what is ideation? It's the third phase of the design thinking process. And it's all about generating ideas. And quickly, what's the design thinking process? It involves five stages. Empathize, define the problem, then ideate, generate a lot of ideas to solve the problem, then create your prototype, and then test run your prototype. That actually also, you can see it, we can also call it the creative thinking process. It's another word for this. They call it design thinking in some schools of thought. It's also called design thinking process. I've taken a course on that, on that with Stanford some years ago. I encourage you to go to, I mean, the ongoing um, Coursera. If you Google create design thinking process, if we come, it can come up, you are, you are going to enjoy that course. It's a very useful one for creativity and problem solving skill. You will really enjoy it. So I encourage you to register for it. And you know, it's going to provoke your creativity and problem solving skill. This is hot market skill presently in the world. Those who are creative and those who are you know, they are eventually going to rule the world because the world is about solving problems. And the more you're able to do that, the more you enter into your prosperity. So those are the five basic processes. But today we'll be focusing on ideation, which is the third phase of the, the creative thinking process. We're going to focus. So what is ideation again? Um, the Nielsen Norman group defines ideation as the process of generating a broad set of ideas on a given topic or issue or challenge with no attempt to judge or evaluate them. Same thing as brainstorming, more or less. So this is also called the concept of divergent thinking. You know, it's actually brainstorming that gives back to that, but there, there are many other techniques that you can use to give back to engage in effective ideation. We're going to be exploring them. Of course, brainstorming is one of them, which we discussed last week, but it's not the only technique of, of coming up with, I mean, engaging in effective ideation. It's not the only one. And don't forget, ideation is synonymous with divergent thinking. It's actually coming up with various solutions, possible solutions to a particular problem. That's what we're talking about here. So what's ideation again? 
you know, in the ideation phase, of course, you explore and come up with many ideas as possible. Now, some of these ideas may, may go on to be potential solutions to your challenge. Some will end up in the, in the dustbin, as it were. But at this stage, the focus is on quantity rather than quality. So you don't begin to judge whether some idea is good or not. You just generate the ideas, first of all. I told you the assignment I was given some time ago in that same particular course I took, Design Thinking Lab. And they were telling me to, my, the problem I focused on that time was, why is it that um, graduates are not relevant in the world of work? And, um, and the, I was given the assignment to generate 100 solutions to that problem, why graduates, university graduates are not relevant to the work, can we solve that problem? And so you can just tr give it a trial and see whether it's easy. So, but in the process, you can compare yourself with somebody who is just waking up and then the first idea that pumps into his mind is what he's going to implement. And somebody who is going through that process of ideation, we will discover that the results they're going to get will be miles apart. No wonder the developed countries, because that's what the process they often go through. They're having better results than those of us in this part of the world because we're too much in a hurry. They want anybody to task you to put you to any stress. You know, it's too stressful. See some of the simple, simple assignments we're giving you now, it's too stressful. If you go now on the, most of these courses, in a single week, see how many videos you have to watch, how many books, references you have to read each week. Some of you have gone through it. So which one is now more stressful? With this 30, 40 minutes of lecture or two hours of lecture in a week, and then maybe one just short or two assignments serving as CA. You can see that we are not yet there. So that's the more reason they're getting better results. So we need to be ready to stretch ourselves a little bit to be able to get better results. In fact, what makes you extraordinary is the extra effort you put into it beyond your colleagues. And so I really want us to begin to prepare our mind to get, you know, to blend down, get our hands dirty a little bit and be ready to work. It's about thinking outside the box. That's what addition is all about. It's about thinking outside the box. So we need to uh, explore how. Huh. Now, why is addition phase so crucial? You know, this is, this is the place where innovation thrives. It represents the key transitional step from learning about your users and the problem to come up with a solution. So in the process of ideation, you get, you, in fact, there is no way you have to focus more on your user, their likes, their dislikes, their passion. And that's what will help you to come up or generate useful and relevant ideas. So if done properly, it actually brings about innovation. Ideation brings about innovation. And that is the quest of creativity and problem solving drive. It's all about innovation, which bats invention. So we need to be, remember that. Now, what is the, why is this phase, ideation phase, so crucial again? Now, according to Don Norman, you know, ideation is crucial because it gets us to question the obvious and challenge the norm and come up with new ideas. You know, many times we are just we settle for the status quo. We don't want to question the, 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 the information that has been submitted to us over the years because maybe it's one authority that gave the submission. No, why should it be so? It doesn't matter who. It is very important in the field of ideation, when you're engaging in ideation, you question the status quo. You reformulate your beliefs. You define, you define existing solutions and definitions. You critique them. They call it critical thinking. And that is the way to go to generate more ideas. So these are some of the things you need to begin to employ. So I'm going to share with you in this, I mean, in this particular lecture, some of the techniques of, you know, of ideation, how you can come up with a lot of ideas, possible, possible solution to your challenge. Now, why is addition so crucial? Again, it helps you to focus on the user rather on the problem alone, because in the process of getting ideas, which is actually talking about solutions to that problem, you need to focus on the user, their passions, their perceptions, their, 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 you know, their likes and dislikes. You need to take all that into consideration when you are engaging in the, pro engaging the process of ideation. So you accumulate unique perspectives and creativity of different people. You, you, you give room for diversity of ideas, and that will help you to innovate in a way you never thought is possible. So that is just, that's actually the bedrock. So what are the key ideation techniques? What are the key ideation techniques you need to apply? One, analogies is one technique. It compare, what does it do? What is, you know when you're, an, when you're applying analogy, you're comparing 
maybe a, 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 an, an abstract idea with a familiar idea. That's what we call analogy, to make people understand that abstract idea that is not easily as, as clickable. You now use a day-to-day -day common example to, as a kind of analogy to clarify or to explain that seemingly abstract idea or uncommon idea. So you can apply this, that same technique to generate a lot of useful, I mean, in ideation. So analogy compares your situation, your design to something you are familiar with, enabling you to look at the problem in new light and consider possible solutions. So that's one technique. We use analogies a lot. You can use analogies in, in to create, um, to come up with um, better ideas of how to solve the problem. Another one is brains, body storming, not brainstorming this time around. This one, body storming. Now you can use body storming technique to generate ideas, to engage in um, very lucrative or effective um, ideation. You know, don't forget we are discussing ideation techniques. Now, the body storming actually is, you physically experience situation now to spark new ideas. You know, so how do you do that? You set up a physical experience assembling the problem you are trying to solve using people, props, or digital. So you try to relieve the actual situation. You may not be able to go to the real life situation, but you may simulate it. You can use props. Props are actually simulatives of that particular scenario. So you can create a kind of scenario of that particular problem or challenge situation, and then you try to relieve it. And so in the process, you come up with ideas. Like um, you can engage in kind of drama to even do that. Like, the way these um, bus, yellow bus drivers in Lagos block roads and cause a lot of hazards, somebody can just, we can just reenact that and you know, create a, um, uh, a simulation of that. And some people acting as damn good drivers who are drunk, who are you know, high or whatever, and then blocking the road. And you just try, in the process of doing that, you discover that you're gonna come up with some, a lot of revelation, a lot of insights to the genesis of the problem, and now you can nip it in the board and solve it. So that's what's called body storming. It's a physical experience assembling the real problem situation using people and props or digital prototypes. You can use, if, I mean, in this part of the world, we may not have that kind of gadget, but when I went, when I was in China a few years ago, 2010, there about, you know, there was a particular um, uh, uh, simulation scenario where if you enter into that gadget, it will transport you into space and the experience you have inside that gadget, that simulation is as if you are actually in space. Pilots too, when they are training them, they use such simulations, you know, into gadgets that actually look as if you are taking off in a plane, you are landing. As it, but when you are inside that gadget, it's as real as if you are inside a plane. They call it simulation. And so you can, that's, you can use such gadgets for body storming because it gives you a real life experience what we are going through and the process to come up with better ideas than if you are not experiencing the real situation. So that's an example of that. Then we have brainstorming, which I've already explained last week, so I don't need to belabor this again, where you just bounce off your ideas verbally. That's what brainstorming, and somebody, a secretary somewhere, or a recording system is capturing all the information, or the ideas are being turned into core statements and pinned on the wall somewhere. So that's brainstorming. Then we also have brain writing. So instead of verbally exchanging the ideas, this time around, somebody is just Instead of verbally, you know, you now somebody is writing down the ideas before passing it, pass it on to the next person. So you write that your ideas on paper, you don't verbalize it out. You just write it down, then you pass it to the next person. And the person can integrate with his own ideas again and pass it on to the next person. And then you continue, that continues around all the participants. So that's brain writing. So if you study it closely, maybe you want to, you know, you just keep adding, either adding to it or coming up with new ones, new ideas to what has been on that paper. And then that's how you keep on passing it around, around until eventually you discover that you come up with ingenious ideas and solutions that nobody has ever thought before. So then you also have brain working. Brain working. In brain working, you know, the person trying to solve the problem, they move between different ideation stations. That is to say, the participants. You, you know, you move, you know, it's a more dynamic, instead of, instead of um, passing ideas or talking it or just passing it on paper, you physically, I mean, you actually move from one person to the other, passing your idea. The designer, you move from different idea stations to that, just like brain writing, they add their own ideas before moving on to the next. But this time around, you literally move from one person to the other, passing your ideas, you know, from one person to the other within the group 
of those who are engaging in brain working. That's what this one is talking about. If you have questions later on, you can always ask, just note it down somewhere. And don't forget again for in terms of your attendance, just pass a comment on the, on the uh, chat forum to just capture your, uh, your attendance as it were. Now, another technique you can use to generate, to engage in the very useful, effective ideation is challenging assumption, as assumptions. I love this so much. You know, there are so many as assumptions that we, over the years, we just take them without even questioning them. Some of them are just superstitious beliefs. Some of them are religious beliefs. Some of them, it can, it can even be an authority in a field of psychology that have passed the idea. Nobody's just praying it or questioning it. And we just swallow them as gospel truth. You'll be shocked and surprised at times when we begin to probe some of these ideas or so-called theories. They can be punctured. So we need to do, we need to once in a while just engage in challenging some of these assumptions. We need to do that. And that is what this part, and in the process, we are likely to come up with more ingenious ideas and solutions that will culminate into solutions to most of our problems and challenges. So that is what challenging assumptions is all about. Then we also have game storming. Actually, you turn some of those ideas you know, generation of ideas techniques into games. And it's more interesting than when you are doing it verbally, when you are doing it in writing, when you are doing it, you know, body storming, going physically from one place to the other. When you're doing that, when you turn it into a game, in the process of spontaneously, you can come up with very unique ideas. So that's why some people use the idea of game storming, you know, to solve the problem. Gamifying classic ideas methods, you know, add an extra element of engagement, interactivity, and helps to suspend some of the normal rules of everyday life. So you turn those ideas, those idea generating um, ventures or efforts into games. That's what game storming is all about. And uh, you'll be very surprised that it can give you. Then we have what you call mind mapping or concept mapping, then developed by Tony Booz in 1972. It encourages you to draw connections between different sorts of ideas or information. And you have to get a board that you can pin some of your ideas in form of a new form. And then you can also draw. A board is always better. You draw the idea that you can now begin to show connection both between those different ideas, between those different concepts. You now begin to show the connections between them. And the process, you know, because the whole thing, the whole idea of ideation, I mean, the whole thing about ideation is seeing, you know, spotting of common connections between different ideas and concepts. That is what we now bring out innovation and ingenuous idea to solve the problem. You may not even quickly see some of the connections between some of the various concepts before, but true concept mapping has to begin to map out those ideas. The issue of, for instance, this same traffic um, jam in Nigeria, I mean, in Lagos State and the um, cosmopolitan city in Lagos, in, in Nigeria, for instance. You'll be, you may not quickly even see the connection of maybe the issue of money, the issue of Nepal, the issue of, you may not even see how they contribute to that issue. So things that we may not even appear there that are contributing to that problem. By the time we begin to brainstorm and engage in ideation, I mean, and then apply this concept mapping, you know, and you now discover that suddenly you now begin to see the root cause of that problem that if taken care of may now solve the problem. If you don't engage in some of these, you know, techniques of concept mapping and code, you may not be able to come up with such ingenuous, ingenuous ideas. <laughs> so this is very important. So you can start by writing keywords in the middle. How do you engage in this concept mapping? You write the keyword of the problem, maybe in the middle of the page, you know, and a very big kind of um, plain sheet, maybe pin on the wall, you know, um, flip chart. And then on the same piece of paper, you can then surround them with words with any or all the ideas that come to your mind. And then finally, you now think of how these ideas are connected. So first of all, you just begin to, you just begin to paste after the initial idea, maybe the problem is we are trying to solve the problem of kidnapping. Then all the various ideas of what could be connected with kidnapping, just push them, push them, push them, and begin to write them there as many as possible then before you now begin to try to show the connection between those concepts. I wish you can try this. It's a very ingenious way of generating useful ideas and of engaging ideation. Very, very interesting. We call that concept mapping. So with all these techniques, they work powerfully and help to ignite our thinking processes 
to be able to come up with ingenious ideas. Then there's also, also what we call reverse thinking. Reverse thinking. Now, you know, the whole idea is that, this is the example. How might we make our online courses more accessible to the masses? It can be reversed. We can reverse that question to now say, how can we make it difficult? As difficult as possible for users to take our online courses. In the process of reversing that question, you'd be surprised that you can come up with more ingenious ideas that will not help us to solve the problem of making our courses more accessible to people. That's what we're talking about here. So you give it a trial, engage reverse thinking. Don't go through the normal process, normal part, part way of phrasing the question. Reverse your question and see, and see the effect on your thinking faculty, what it's going to do. So these are some quite ingenious ways, proven over time to actually work wonders when it comes to, into the uh, school of ideation. Then there's another one we call Scamper. You know, Scamper. You know, it prompts the designer or somebody trying to solve a problem to you know, and the key words you use when we are scampering is that um, we can substitute a topic with equivalent or similar topic. You can combine the original topic with additional information. You can adjust the problem by coming up with an alternative way of constructing the problem. You can modify the topic. You can put it to other uses. You can eliminate ideas or characters that are not valuable, and then you can reverse and rearrange the problem in order to come up with brand new concepts or ideas. So these are all scampering ideas. So as you engage all these keywords, you can, in the process, you discover that you come up with more ingenious ideas to solve that problem. You come up with more ingenious ideas to solve the problem. So that's the way it is. Then you have also called what you call storyboarding, you know, and the whole idea is that, you know, um, first of all, try to identify the personal experiences of the end users. I mean, those who are directly involved in that particular problem or solution you are trying to prefer. Who are the end users of that solution? And then you draw their personal experiences, especially bordering on their emotions and feelings because emotion seems to be the strongest driver of human behavior. So you try to, and in the process, you now enact a kind of storyline, draw out various storylines in the process and vivid, create a kind of vivid picture. You can paint a vivid picture of that scenario. And the process, it can ignite your thinking process to come up with ingenious ideas that will solve that problem. So you can create a storyline around the challenge or problem. You know, they call it storyboarding. And so these are all ingenious proven over the years. Then um, you also have what you call the worst possible idea. Maybe out of all the ideas now, it's almost, this particular step is almost starting at the beginning point of your convergent thinking. You know, out of all the plethora of ideas, there's no way you now eventually now begin to now begin to assess each all your ideas to now see which one is the worst possible. But in this case, you just try to identify which one is the worst possible idea and why. In the process, it can ignite more ideas to solve the problem. That's the point here. That's the, the technique here. So we are not yet actually starting convergent thinking at this stage. You just try to see which one is the, out of all these ideas who have popped up with, which one is the worst possible idea and why? So you go in search of the worst possible idea. And when, by the time you begin to reflect on what's so terrible about these ideas, it can reveal more valuable insights into what, is a, good, what a good idea might look like. That's the, that's the ingenuity of this technique. So out of all the plethora of problems, I mean, to support the solution ideas you've come up with, just quickly identify which one is the worst possible idea in terms of this and why. And you can be surprised, it can ignite better ideas again. And that is actually what this step is all about. So I hope you're picking and learning some things here. So, I mean, I've given you quite a number of ideas of how to, I mean, how to engage, I mean, on this ideation, what we call ideation techniques. This is the bedrock of creativity and development. There are more, much more than this. It's just the tip of the iceberg I've just given you. You have creative pulse. You have cheat storming, you have crowd storming, you have daydreaming, you have provocation, you also have first relationships, you have role play, we have visualization, we have wishing, we have sketching and sketch storming, and we have synetics. So these are some of the ideas that we have for in terms of ideation techniques. Now, by way of final words, I want you to caution that when deciding which addition technique to use, think about the nature of the problem and the people taking part in the addition process. And I also want to highlight that you also think about the end users of that solution. 
It's a critical thing you need to consider when you want to begin to come up and generate your ideas or engage in your ideation process. Very critical. So it is very important that you take all this into consideration. So choose your technique which, which are suitable for the group size. At the same time, consider the method, that's, method that is most likely put participants at ease and elicit the best response among this particular group of people. This is very, very important. And as you engage in this, I see you actually um, coming up with ingenious ideas. So I'm going to pause here and allow you, because it's just less than 10 minutes left. I always want us to engage in discussion. It should not just be one way kind of oratorium talk. I expect that we all participate in these and